All righty. Hi, everyone. My name is Julia Mayetta. Um, we are so pleased that you all could join us for this lecture, um, which is part of our 12-week didactic series. Um, if we could get next slide, Dr. Fang. Um, let's see. Do we have next slide? Um, one moment, it's a little strange. That's okay. I'll try resharing. Okay, no worries. Um, I can keep going with the intro. So uh, this series from No Neuropsychology brings you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. There we go, perfect. Um, so our next slide, uh, this uh, No Neuropsychology Didactic Series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free high quality didactic opportunities for the international neuropsychology community. If we could advance two slides, please. Perfect. Um, so before we start here, are the disclaimers for this series. So this training is not meant to replace formal education in neurosology, and the views of the speakers are their own and do not reflect the official endorsement of any institution or organization. Uh, next slide. Uh, if you have any issues joining with the audio, you may need to click the join audio button or change your input on the lower left hand of your screen. Um, questions for our speaker can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left of your screen next to the chat. Um, we will address questions to the speaker during the last 10 minutes of the talk and a recording of today's lecture will be provided later this week. Next slide. Uh, now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Katie Bangen for today's lecture on mild cognitive impairment. Dr. Bangen is a board certified neuropsychologist, assistant professor of psychiatry in the UCSD School of Medicine, and research health science specialist at the VA San Diego Healthcare System. She earned her PhD in clinical psychology from the SDSU uh, UCSD joint doctoral program, completed a pre-doctoral clinical internship at UCLA, and completed postdoctoral fellowships at UCSD and, San and the VA San Diego. Her research uh, uses various neuroimaging tools to investigate the underlying neurobiological mechanisms of cognitive decline in aging, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia, as well as to identify neuroimaging-based biomarkers of dementia risk. Her research, uh, current research projects are funded by the VA, NIA, Alzheimer's Association, and the Dana Foundation. In addition to research and teaching, she provides clinical neuropsychology services as a part of the Memory Aging and Resilience Clinic at UCSD. So without further ado, we will hand it over to Dr. Bangin. Okay, thank you, Julia, for the kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation to come speak to you all today. Um, this is a really fantastic didactic series that has been put together, and I'm very happy you know, to be a part of it. Um, and happy to be here to talk to you all about mild cognitive impairment. Um, so this is something that I focus on both clinically and in my research. Um, you know, as Julia mentioned, I see cases at the UCSD Memory Aging and Resilience Clinic, or the MARC, um, where we see a lot of mild cognitive impairment. Um, and I've also been studying MCI in my research um, since about 2000. Two for so for quite a while now. I'll speak to you all today about it. So um, to begin, I have no financial disclosures to report and um, no conflicts of interest to report. So the presentation today, I'll talk about malcognitive impairment, go over definitions, um, some history and background, also difficulties and challenges in the field and ongoing research. So I'll talk about some of my own work as well as um, work of my colleagues and close collaborators at UC San Diego, especially um, Mark Bondi, Bondi, Emily Edmonds, Lisa Delano Wood, um, Kelsey Thomas, who are also all researching um, mild cognitive impairment. And I'll focus on um, a few main areas. So I'll talk about um, neuropsychological diagnostic criteria for MCI, um, MCI subtypes and heterogeneity within MCI, and then also um, vascular contributions to cognitive impairment, which is one of my um, main um, areas of interest in my research. So neurodegenerative conditions of late life, such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, um, involve slowly accruing neuronal loss that evolves over years before symptom onset. 
Um, so we can see here in this graph, um, you know, performance on the y-axis and age on the x-axis. So you can kind of see this trajectory here where people may go from normal aging and if they're on the path to dementia, and there's a prodromal period, um, and that's you know, where we think of MCI being. And then eventually people may cross this threshold you know, over into dementia. So I'll, I'll be talking a lot today about Alzheimer's disease you know, as well, um, because MCI was initially conceptualized as a transition state from normal aging to dementia within you know, Alzheimer's disease um, specifically. And it's now thought there's you know, many years um, between when a person, you know, starts to have pathological changes associated with Alzheimer's disease and when they have um, clinical symptom onset, so maybe even 20 years. So a long um, preclinical or prodromal period. So a lot of research is focused on, you know, trying to identify people as early as possible during this stage so that interventions, you know, as they're developed in treatments can target people you know, as early as possible before there's advanced or irreversible neuronal loss and other changes. So over time, there have been many different suggested terms to use to describe people with impairment who don't have full dementia. And this table here is from a review paper that's a few years old, um, but I still like this table because you will see some of these terms still in the literature. Um, so I'll still sometimes come across these terms, there's a bunch here listed, but for example, you know, people might refer to this um, period before dementia as mild cognitive decline, questionable dementia, aging associated cognitive decline, mild or cognitive decline, cognitive impairment no dementia, and you get the picture, but there's you know, many different terms that have been used. And really the newest terms that you'll probably see most often um, you know, in more recent um, literature is mild cognitive impairment due to Alzheimer's disease. And that's from um, the National Institute on Aging and Alzheimer's Association work group um, criteria. And then also mild neurocognitive disorder due to Alzheimer's disease, which is from the DSM-5. So MCI um, you know, has been conceptualized as a transitional state between normal aging and Alzheimer's disease, as we already touched upon. Um, and you know, there's been different criteria proposed, but kind of the first um, well-established or well-accepted criteria was put forth by Ron Peterson and colleagues. And this criteria um, required a memory complaint that was preferably corroborated by an informant, an objective memory impairment, normal general cognitive function, intact activities of daily living. So this would differentiate you know, MCI from a dementia. And just as an example of someone who might you know, um, fit this criteria, how they might make this criteria, as someone who had you no know, memory complaint that would be corroborated by an informant, um, such as a family member, um, they might perform poorly on um, a logical memory, um, delayed recall. And oftentimes, um, especially with the earlier criteria, there was a focus on um, paragraph or story memory. An MMSC score um, that would be you know, within um, the normal range broadly. A global clinical dementia rating of 0.5. So the CDR um, you know, ranges from with a zero being normal cognition and then a one being mild, very mild dementia. And then these people again would you know, not be demented. So we differentiate MCI from dementia um, because it would have cognitive and functional abilities that were preserved to the extent that they wouldn't qualify for, for the um, diagnosis of dementia. So you can see that you know, that early criteria really placed an emphasis on memory. And with more studies and more research you know, in the early 2000s on MCI, and I think at that point and at certain times, MCI was actually the most um, studied um, topic in the field of neurology. Um, and it became apparent as people looked at, um, you know, different samples and different cohorts um, that there were people who had mild cognitive impairment um, and it wasn't necessarily in memory. So maybe other domains were affected. So this is one example of a study um, where they found that, you know, memory only was impaired in 30% of the MCI sample. And then a, a number a little bit larger than that maybe had memory plus another domain. So memory and um, visual spatial impairment or memory and executive function impairment for all three. 
but really there's a sizable number. Um, so 19% that had executive function impairment only, 11% um, that had visual spatial impairment only, and then other combinations as well. So over time it became clear um, that you know, many individuals might have an impairment um, in a non-memory domain. We know Alzheimer's disease um, you know, often begins with a memory impairment, but not always. You know, there's other um, presentations as well where non-memory domains are affected first. And so, you know, with that, um, you know, additional research, uh, MCI um, was expanded to include different subtypes. So, you know, people met criteria for MCI, you can see here in the flow chart, you know, we asked if, what well, was memory impaired? And if yes, you know, they have an amnestic MCI. If it's memory impairment only and no other domains were impaired, this would be considered amnestic MCI single domain. You know, if they had a memory impairment plus impairment in another domain, such as executive functioning or language, um, then this would be amnestic MCI multiple domain. And then the same for non-amnestic MCI. So if you know, people did not have a memory impairment but were impaired in other domains, um, they could either have a single domain non-amnestic impairment or multiple domain non-amnestic non MCI. So this table um, kind of compares some of the different diagnostic criteria you know, for MCI that have evolved over time. And they've changed somewhat. I have already referred to kind of the original um, criteria where again, there had to be a self or informant reported memory complaint and an objective memory impairment, yet preserved general cognitive functioning and functional abilities. Um, and then over time and more recently with the NIA, AA and the DSM-5 criteria, um, you know, this does not have to be a memory impairment. So there should be, you know, a, a cognitive complaint and objective cognitive impairment, but it can be in a non-memory domain and they can, you know, have MCI um, due to AD. So, you know, some of the um, criteria has changed a little bit over time, but really kind of the core um, idea and construct has, has remained. So people may have seen these um, curves or this figure before. I see it presented a lot in different talks on Alzheimer's disease. Um, but this is the hypothetical model of Alzheimer's disease Re and really um, kind of the, the current model that most uh, Alzheimer's disease and MCI research adheres to. Um, so here we have um, biomarkers going from normal to abnormal on the y-axis as a function of clinical disease stage. Um, so going from cognitive, cognitively normal to MCI to dementia. And you can see in this, the red curve, the first curve, that's amyloid. So it's thought to be the earliest change that could be detected. And then blue is tau. So amyloid and tau are the two kind of hallmark neuropathologies of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then there's brain structure changes in green later memory um, and purple um, would change and then clinical function. So you can see this model, it's you know, very focused on amyloid and also um, kind of suggests that memory changes occur you know, many years later, um, you know, quite late along this um, continuum. Um, and that's of course debatable because it depends on how sensitive you know, the different cognitive tests you use are. And I'll talk about that more, um, more later. So there has been a push to incorporate biomarkers for the National Institute on Aging and Alzheimer's Association criteria um, that came out in 2011. Um, they suggest a two-step diagnostic procedure where individuals are classified clinically as MCI using the core clinical criteria um, we um, covered earlier. Um, and then there's an attempt to determine uh, the underlying etiology of the clinical syndrome, with really a focus on um, two different classes of biomarkers. And again, these are the hallmark kind of changes um, in Alzheimer's disease. There's biomarkers of amyloid beta protein deposition. So this could be either through um, cerebral spinal fluid um, or you know, PET imaging of the brain. Um, and then biomarkers of neuronal degeneration or injury. So this could be um, tau through imaging, through PET imaging, or cerebral spinal fluid measures, um, or um, hippocampal volume. And then so depending on you know, whether individuals um, are positive, negative, or if they were not tested on these different classes of biomarkers, then they can meet criteria for MCI due to 
AD with intermediate likelihood. If one of the biomarkers is positive, so either amyloid or tau, um, and the other is untested, um, or high likelihood if both biomarkers, both amyloid and the neuronal injury biomarker, are both positive. And then um, they, this criteria would say that the MCI, um, you know, the clinical MCI is unlikely due to Alzheimer's disease if both amyloid and the neuronal injury biomarker are negative. So there's obviously a, you know, a big focus on amyloid and tau with that criteria and most of the models um, of AD and MCI. Um, but we know that there is a lot of heterogeneity in terms of the underlying neuropathology in MCI. So there have been several different neuropathological studies um, performed. This work is by um, Julie Schneider at Rush. Um, so what they did is they found, uh, they had a sample where the people who had amnestic MCI and non-amnestic MCI for death, they were clinically diagnosed. And then they came to autopsy and they looked at the different types of neuropathology. So you can see for both types of MCI, that about a third of the sample had Alzheimer's disease pathology only. That about a third of the sample had no major neuropathology or other. So this might be Lewy bodies or some other um, form of neuropathology. And then about a third of the sample had infarcts, so cerebrovascular disease, um, either alone or you know, in combination with Alzheimer's disease. So what we can see is, you know, MCI is very uh, pathologically heterogeneous, and pure AD pathology is common, is relatively common to both amnestic and non-amnestic MCI, but other pathologies are also common in both subtypes. So some difficulties and challenges with um, MCI diagnosis. So one is, you know, defining the boundaries between normal aging and MCI are between MCI and mild dementia. And we deal with this a lot um, in the clinic, especially where I work, where people might be kind of in the gray zone and making that determination um, can be a challenge. And then defining and measuring cognitive impairments and how to best do that. There's um, some debate around that. Um, so the rates of abnormal test scores, you know, increase as the number of tests administered increases and decrease as you know, cutoffs are lowered. And suggested cutoffs for MCI have varied quite a bit. So different cutoffs that have been reported and used in the literature are negative one. So one standard deviation below you know, normative mean means um, 1.5 standard deviations below um, normative means or even 1.96. And there have been others who suggested that we shouldn't use kind of an artificial cutoff and that clinical decision um, should be based on memory impairment that's out of proportion to an individual's other cognitive domains. Although we know um, that you know, individuals don't perform equally across all cognitive domains and you know, this type of um, decision making would, would assume that, which, which can be a problem. And then defining and measuring functional impairments um, can also be a challenge. So, you know, often in clinic, um, we're relying on informant report and, and self-report. Um, the global CDR, so the clinical dementia rating scale, which is often used as well, that somewhat actually ignores um, ADLs. And what would probably be ideal, really, is we could observe people right, in their everyday life, but that's not feasible. So we do try to administer performance-based assessments of complex instrumental activities of daily living. So we have different tests where we can ask people or observe them, um, you know, managing medications or doing financial management and things like that. And another um, issue is just the uncertainty of prognosis with MCI. So in clinic, um, when we have feedback sessions and we you know, deliver diagnosis, this is one of the most common questions from patients and family members, understandably, is they want to know, you know how they're going to progress, if they're going to you know, go on to convert to dementia, and you know, what is the course going like, to look like for them. And you know, with MCI, you know, many people do progress, but there are also people who are even revert um, to normal cognition, and I'll talk about that. Um, but there's obviously a lot of uncertainty for each individual, kind of what the prognosis might be. And there's, um, in some of the diagnostic criteria, there's been a requirement, you know, of subjective complaints. And uh, this can be a little bit controversial. There's some studies that suggest that subjective complaints can be very useful. 
um, and very early detection that people you know, might notice themselves having memory issues before they would show memory decline or memory impairment on objective testing. But there's also other research that suggests that subjective complaints may relate more to depression or mood or um, sleep disturbances. So it's a little unclear, I think. Um, the literature is a little bit mixed on how helpful subjective complaints may be. So, you know, we have a lack of consensus on a uniform set of criteria for MCI. And that's resulted in, you know, highly variable prevalence rates, um, you know, ranging from 1 to 3%. And um, Amy Jack from UCSD um, did a nice review of a lot of this data and the, the various different diagnostic criteria. Um, and found, you know, annual rates of conversion from MCI to dementia can vary from 1% to 72%. So there can be a lot of discrepancies. And samples drawn from memory clinics do have a higher progression rate than population-based um, samples. A lot of these people are coming, you know, into the clinic because they do have a, you know, memory concern. And then rates of reverting from MCI to cognitively normal also vary. So ranging from about 10 to 40%, depending on the criteria. And the instability um, or reversion, it might be related to subtype as there's you know, evidence that single domain versus you know, multiple domain presentations may be more unstable. So despite increasing sophistication in genetics, imaging and biomarkers, there really hasn't been the same kind of increase in the sophistication and profiling and cognition in MCI. And some of that um, relates to kind of emphasis on cognitive screening measures, you know, such as the mini mental state, which may diminish sensitivity, um, a push for fewer measures, um, and you know, briefer batteries, which could diminish reliability. And again, this you know, lack of consensus on a uniform set of criteria. And different ways by which MCI is diagnosed. So relying on a few measures, relying on clinical judgment, um, you know, different studies and different clinicians are, are doing different things. So this was a paper written by um, Amy Jack and my other colleagues at UCSD, where they actually compared five different um, approaches to defining MCI. And I'm gonna touch on um, three of these here. So um, I'll discuss three of the approaches um, or the three of the different criteria that are more commonly um, reported in the literature. There were two other criteria they also examined and one was a very kind of liberal criteria and the other one was a very conservative so two kind of more extreme approaches um, but these three are what you will commonly see in the literature. So the comprehensive neuropsychological criteria. So this um, this also goes by different names. Um, you may see um, you know, because of this, this paper and this, uh, this research, sometimes it's called Jack Bondi criteria. You may see that sometimes um, if you're at INS or other places, or if you're reading papers about MCI, um, or also the actuarial neuropsychological criteria. So this set does have a few different names, but this was you know, developed given evidence um, that reflect the difficulty of interpreting you know, an isolated impaired score. So we know that multiple measures you know, provide a more reliable estimate of a cognitive construct than just a single measure. And Bob Heaton's um, work has shown that the majority of neurologically normal adults will score in the paired range on at least one measure if you give a large battery. And more than 20% um, of healthy older adults obtain one impaired score in two different domains, but far fewer, um, so less than 5% earn um, two or more impaired scores in the same domain. So it seems that, you know, a cutoff score of one standard deviation provides the best sensitivity um, and specificity. So the historical criteria, and we've already touched on this some, but um, this criteria um, looked at memory on one test. And if, if memory performance on um, story memory, if it fell 1.5 standard deviation below published norms, and that person was considered, you know, to to have memory impairment. Um, and then the global cognitive functioning, um, MSE, um, needed to be intact as well as the clinical, um, the CDR, the clinical dementia rating scale. 
So the typical criteria um, which we've also um, touched upon, so this is very commonly used. So this is kind of the historical criteria that was revised um, to include non-memory domains. So it requires you know, one test within the cognitive domain needs to fall 1.5 standard deviations below um, normative means to um, be considered impaired within that domain. And then the comprehensive neuropsychological criteria um, developed by Amy Jack and Mark Bondi. So it requires two tests in a domain to fall one, one standard deviation below norms. Um, the performance-based complex instrumental activities of daily living um, must be intact. Um, so again, you know, based on prior research, it seems that one standard deviation below norms um, provide the best sensitivity and specificity, but to kind of balance that with reliability. Um, so the, the cut score is now, you know, one um, standard deviation below norms instead of 1.5, but two tests, you know, need to fall in that range for a domain to be considered um, impaired. So again, trying to balance sensitivity and reliability. And so um, within our local UCSD sample, um, Amy Jack um, went to see, you know, how many different people would meet criteria for MCI based on these different, um, different criteria. So the comprehensive criteria, about a third of the sample met criteria for MCI. Um, for the typical criteria, um, it was about almost half, about 49%. Um, at criteria for MCI. And then the historical criteria, which again, just focused on logical memory, 11% um, of the sample met criteria for MCI. So it seemed the comprehensive criteria um, is really in the middle of the other two and seemed about right, because 50% of our sample, which is a healthy sample, for 50% to have MCI seemed quite high, and 11% seems pretty low. Um, so the comprehensive criteria you know, came in in the middle. Um, and seemed you know more reasonable. So then we you know looked at brain-based support for this criteria um, and looked at different biomarkers and this is just one study that we did where we did manual tracings of hippocampal volumes on MRI and then compared um, the conventional um, criteria. So this is the typical criteria um, you know versus the comprehensive or the that Jack Bondi criteria. So when we use that conventional um, criteria, we're getting only one test um, needed to be impaired um, to meet um, criteria for MCI. The amnestic MCI group had non-significant associations with hippocampal volume. When we looked at the comprehensive criteria, where again, individuals had to be impaired on the two tests for memory to be considered impaired, the amnestic MCI had significantly smaller hippocampal volumes, which is what we would you know, hypothesize and expect. So this is one example, but there have been multiple studies you know, looking at this criteria. It does seem to relate better to, um, to biomarkers. So another approach um, has been to look at statistically determined subtypes of MCI, so empirically um, determined subtypes. So these studies have used cluster analysis, which is a statistical technique that groups individuals on the basis of their test scores or biomarkers, but it's not based on you know, artificial cutoffs or you know, long-term trajectories. And individuals are separating to groups so that those within our group are as similar to each other as possible, and then the groups are as different from each other as possible. And cluster analysis is a descriptive approach. So then discriminant function analyses have been used then to quantitatively show the ability of the neuropsychological measures to discriminate the clustered subgroups. So this is one study that we did with our local um, UCSD data, uh, where we did a cluster analysis of 13 uh, neuropsychological measures from five different cognitive domains. Um, and we diagnosed our sample you know, using that um, conventional, um, and sometimes we call it the peterson winblad for the authors who you know, first proposed this criteria. And 134 participants were diagnosed with MCI based on that conventional criteria requiring just one test to be impaired. Um, and then when we, when we use the actuarial or comprehensive um, Jack Bondi criteria where two tests um, needed to be you know, impaired, 80 participants were diagnosed with MCI. And so this is showing results, um, looking at the performance of the different um, clusters across different cognitive domains. Um, so we have language, memory, executive function, attention, and visual spatial skills. 
And this is using the conventional MCI criteria. So again, impairment defined using you know, the cutoff of 1.5 or more standard deviations below normative means on at least one measure in the battery. And so this work is actually, um, this study was spearheaded by Lindsay Clark, who's now at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and so, you know, what um, she found was, you know, within the conventional MCI, cri MCI criteria, there were three groups that came out of the cluster analysis. So in the uh, um, bar graph here, the um, bars with the lines, with the diagonal lines, that's an amnestic and language impaired group. Um, and there was a mixed group in the dark gray where you can see these people have some impairments in you know, language, memory, executive functioning, visual, spatial um, abilities. And then there was this, what, we, um, what they called cluster derived normal group. So th these were people who were diagnosed with MCI, you know, based on this conventional criteria, um, you know, based on one test. But then we looked at the performance across, you know, multiple different tests and look at the average of the group. Clearly, these people are performing, you know, right around zero. Um, and these are z-scores here, so they're performing right around average. So they didn't have um, impaired scores here. So then we, um, you know, did the analysis looking at the comprehensive MCI criteria. So again, impairment defined using a cutoff of one or more standard deviations below normative means on at least two measures in a domain. And so with a comprehensive criteria, um, what we found was, you know, four different groups. There was a disexecutive group, um, and some of these bars might be a little bit hard to tell apart, but it's the, um, you know, first bar that's in its, um, the darkest. The amnestic group um, that has these diagonal lines. The mixed group, which is like a medium gray, um, that's impaired across multiple domains. And then a visual spatial um, subtype, which is like the light, light kind of gray or, or white. So these cluster analyses reveal different MCI subtypes depending on you know, the MCI definition used. So both diagnostic schemes, so both um, the conventional criteria and the comprehensive Jack Bondi criteria revealed amnestic and mixed subtypes. And the mixed subtype was more severely impaired um, in both schemes, both the conventional and the comprehensive criteria. But almost half of the, those um, individuals who were you know, diagnosed with MCI using the conventional criteria um, looked to be cognitively normal, really, um, suggesting that this diagnostic scheme might be susceptible to false positive errors. So then um, Mark Bondi and Emily Edmonds and other colleagues at UCSD apply these techniques in the ADNI sample. Um, so it's the Alzheimer's Disease and Neuroimaging Initiative. It's a very large longitudinal study, a national study, um, and ADNI data is um, freely available for people who might be interested in um, you know, pursuing research questions within ADNI. So we've used it for many, many of our studies because um, it's large samples and they have um, you know, biomarker data, cognitive data, genetic data, um, and you write a research proposal, um, and then you can get access and freely download um, data. So it can be a great resource um, if people are, are interested. Um, but we did this, or Mark and um, Emily and others did this cluster analysis of over a thousand ADNI participants by conventional ADNI diagnostic criteria, and then also the neuropsychological Jack Bondi criteria. So ADNI MCI criteria is similar to kind of the historical um, criteria that we, that we covered before, where um, a subjective memory complaint reported by the participant or their study partner is required, an MSC score of 24 to 30, that global um, CDR score of 0.5, an abnormal memory function doc documented by scoring within an education adjusted range on logical memory too and one of the stories of logical memory too. A general cognitive and functional performance has to be su uh, sufficiently preserved so the individual would not qualify for a diagnosis of dementia. So the neuropsychological criteria, um, so you know, we've talked about that a little bit already. Um, there are a couple of um, you know, minor adaptations here. So um, you can meet criteria for MCI if you had an impaired score defined as 
you know, um, one situation or more below age corrective normative means on two measures in a cognitive domain. So with an ADNI, um, there's not as large of a neuropsychological battery as we have in our local, um, our local studies. So here we're able to look at memory, language, and speed or executive function, but not visual spatial skills or other abilities. Um, and another thing is, um, we didn't want to use, um, when we're, we've been um, researching with ADNI and looking at cluster analysis, we want to avoid using tests that went into the ADNI MCI diagnosis, so logical memory. Um, so we use list learning, list learning measures when we've been uh, studying ADNI. Um, so this was kind of the criteria I've mentioned before, you know, where you have, um, you know, two measures in a cognitive domain impaired. Um, but also another um, criteria that um, was used was if an individual had one impaired score in each of the three domains sampled, they could actually qualify for MCI that way, or their score on the FAQ. So this is a measure of functional abilities, um, was nine or greater. So higher score means more functional difficulties, and nine or higher would indicate dependence in three or more daily activities. So this is looking at the diagnostic rates comparing the ADNI conventional criteria to the neuropsychological comprehensive criteria. And I think what um, you know, is most striking here is um, that red font of where there's 460 individuals or 40% um, you know, of these individuals who were diagnosed with MCI with the ADNI diagnosis, but considered normal with a neuropsychological criteria diagnosis. So again, suggesting some you know, false positives. So this, um, these bar graphs are showing kind of the different um, mean cognitive scores um, for the different um, clusters with the different diagnostic criteria. So we have that conventional criteria on the left and the neuropsychological criteria there on the right. Um, and Again, this is ADNI, um, and so we're a little bit, you know, we're a little bit limited in the neuropsychological tests um, that we can use. Um, but there were two language measures, so animals is in blue, um, Boston naming test in green, um, two executive functioning or processing speed measures, so trails A and B are in um, red and yellow, and then ABLT, so list learning, recall, and recognition um, are in purple and gray. And so you can see, um, you know, the mean performance across these different um, clusters. So the conventional criteria, you know, there's an amnestic group where you can see there were just impaired on memory. It's the first group. Then it is executive mixed group that have had impairment across um, the different cognitive domains. And then this, you know, cluster derived normal group, which is the same thing that we saw in our local sample. We saw this you know, cluster derived um, normal group. There it is there, so you can see all the means um, you know, hovering near, near zero. And then for the neuropsychological criteria, there's a three cluster solution there. Um, so there's an amnestic MCI group, um, an impaired language, and then the disexecutive um, mixed group. Where you can see they're kind of impaired across the domains, but you know, most, um, they're most impaired in um, you know, the trail making test and executive functioning. And there's you know, no cluster-derived normal group. So these findings in ADNI are quite similar to the cluster analysis um, study that we did in our local UCSD data. And um, this, this graph here is looking at amyloid. Um, and it's looking at amyloid in cerebral spinal fluid. So higher um, CSF amyloid um, reflects lower amyloid in the brain. So higher um, would be better. And on the left side, um, we have the um, clusters, you know, based on the ADNI kind of conventional um, MCI criteria, and you can see, you know, the amnestic and disexecutive mixed have the, the lower um, CSF amyloid, so more amyloid in the brain compared to the cluster derived normal and cognitively normal groups. And importantly, you know, those two groups look very similar: that cluster derived normal and cognitively normal group. And then on the right um, are the amyloid, CSF amyloid results um, for the clusters based on the comprehensive um, Jack Bondi criteria. 
So you can see the cognitively normal group, that's um, higher, uh, CSF, amyloid, and the MCI groups um, all lower, as you would expect. And again, no cluster-derived normal group. And looking at progression rates, um, you know, MCI based on ADDIE criteria during follow-up, 28% of those individuals um, progressed to dementia, whereas 45% um, progressed to dementia when MCI was based on the neuropsychological criteria. Um, you know, both um, criteria have a relatively low reversion to normal rates, but it is higher, so 4% with the MCI, you know, based on the ADNI conventional criteria, um, and less than 1% when MCI is based on the neuropsychological criteria. And so this is a study where we looked at um, amyloid burden um, within the brain, so this is um, PET, uh, neuroimaging. So here, you know, more um, amyloid means it's, it's more amyloid in the brain, so higher is worse, you know, unlike um, with CSF. And so I realize there's a lot of um, symbols and things going on in this graph, um, but what we're looking at is just on the y-axis, we have the, the mean um, uptake, so just the amount of, of, of amyloid, um, correlating to the amount of amyloid. And then on the x-axis, we have the different brain regions, so frontal, cingulate, parietal, temporal, and then total um, cortical amyloid. And so here we have the amnestic MCI in gray, just executive or mixed, um, have those diagonal lines, um, cluster drive normal is the dark, darkest bar, and then um, we have our normal controls on the right of each of these um, groups. So, you know, as expected, the amnestic and disexecutive mixed groups um, you know, do have more amyloid in the brain compared to the cluster of normal and normal controls who you know, do not differ from each other. And this, um, for this study, we use the same um, you know, clusters that were derived from um, Emily and Mark um, from earlier um, ADNI studies. And so this is you know, using, um, again, the ADNI um, conventional MCI criteria um, for these clusters. That's what they're based on. And this is just showing um, amyloid positivity, the distribution of that across our various um, MCI groups and, and normal groups. And so this is using established you know, thresholds. Um, but we found was 78% um, of the disexecutive mixed MCI group was amyloid positive, 63% um, of the amnestic MCI, 42% um, of the cluster derived normal, and 30% of the the normal control group um, met criteria for amyloid positivity, which is shown in black in each of those um, charts. So just to summarize um, these ADNI MCI diagnostic studies. So the conventional MCI diagnosis you know, produces cognitively normal subtypes. So about a third of the ADNI MCI sample, I think it was even higher than we, when we looked in our local sample. Um, and there were few genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, normal levels of CSF amyloid and PTAU and PET amyloid, um, fewer individuals who progressed to dementia and more individuals who reverted from MCI to um, normal cognition. You know, in contrast, the neuropsychological criteria produced three distinct cognitive MCI subtypes and there were um, stronger CSF and PET um, AD biomarker associations, more stable diagnosis, and with less reversion, greater percentages who progress to dementia, and importantly, no national criteria you know, seems susceptible to false positive diagnostic errors. And this may be due to its underreliance on neuropsychological performance and overreliance on you know, single impaired test scores, rating scales such as the CDR and screen measures such as the MMC and subjective ratings of memory complaints. So this susceptibility of the might problematic. One is this criteria is often used in clinical trials. Um, so prior MCI studies could be diluting, you know, important biomarker relationships that we're not seeing um, because of these false positives. So using this in actuarial neuropsychological method can help circumvent the 
in the field to kind of pre-MCI. So I think one of my you know, very first slides showed the trajectory um, you know, of dementia. And you know, there's this long um, kind of preclinical or prodromal period. And there's been so much work on mild cognitive impairment. But now a lot of the field wants to look at people even before they develop MCI. And we're just kind of figuring out how to do that. And there's some different ideas about how to look at this. But one thing we've been doing in our group, and a lot of this work um, has been spearheaded by uh, Kelsey Thompson, objective subtle cognitive decline. So this is a, this figure I think is from a neurology paper that we just published um, that Kelsey um, first authored. And we refer to objectively defined subtle cognitive difficulties uh, because we looked at cognition cross-sectionally. So I think the reviewers of the paper didn't like that we were referring to decline. So here, these are uh, um, subtle cognitive difficulties, but they're difficulties or inefficiencies on some sensitive cognitive tasks, even though the overall neuropsychological profile is in the normal range. So you kind of can see the trajectory here. We have you know, our SCD or subtle cognitive decline you know, pre preceding MCI. And so we've been working some on how to best define um, solid cognitive decline. <clears throat> so what Kelsey um, and Emily have been working on is, you know, different criteria. And what was done for a couple of, of recent projects is people could meet criteria for subtle cognitive decline if they had one impaired total test score, so one or more standard deviation below demographically adjusted means in two different cognitive domains, so memory language or attention executive functioning. Um, or two impaired neuropsychological process scores, so from the AVLT, and this is primarily um, had been applied this criteria in ADNI, um, which uses the AVLT. So looking at things like learning slope, retroactive interference, intrusion errors, um, because we know besides total score, but the process of how people complete, um, you know, task and the errors are, you know, have a lot of important information. Or if people had one impaired total test score and one impaired process score, they could meet criteria for subtle cognitive decline. <clears throat> so here's, I'm just showing with, for a couple of these ADME studies, what the specific criteria was. Um, so earlier I had shown um, you know, the different neuropsychological tests we've looked at in ADME, and these are the same. So looking at you know, AVLT, um, free recall, and, and um, immediate and delayed free recall from memory. Um, Boston naming test and animal fluency for language, and then trails A and B for attention executive functioning. And here are the different process variables um, that Kelsey calculated. So looking at intrusion errors across different trials, um, learning slope, or retroactive interference. So this is a graph showing, um, again in ADNI, um, looking at different biomarkers and the proportion of um, individuals with positive biomarkers. So we have amyloid, and then we have the p-tau amyloid ratio, and then a total tau amyloid ratio. And you know, within each of those different biomarkers, there's normal cognitively unimpaired individuals um, in the lightest blue, and then an early um, cell cognitive decline, and then late subtle cognitive decline, and then the darkest bar is MCI. So you can see that these subtle cognitive decline groups, their biomarker, or the rate of um, positivity is in between you know, normals um, and MCI. And then Kelsey also showed um, that those with subtle cognitive decline are more likely to progress to MCI over just a five-year follow-up in the first graph, and then 10 years in the second graph. And so the top line shows people who are cognitively normal, and then the um, darker lines and that are lower show early and late subtle cognitive decline. So people are more likely to progress to MCI. And this is a paper um, that I mentioned that we just have um, published in neurology looking at objective subtle cognitive difficulties and future amyloid accumulation and um, neurodegeneration. So this figure on the left shows trajectories of amyloid PET by cognitive group. Um, and then the figure on the right is entorhinal um, cortex thinning by cognitive group. And in both graphs, we have an MCI in green, objective subtle cognitive decline in blue, and then cognitively normal um, in red. So you can see, again, this um, subtle cognitive decline group really is kind of in between um, the MCI and the normals. 
And what we found was relative to the cognitively normal group, those with subtle cognitive decline um, showed faster amyloid accumulation and also selective vulnerability of antirrhinal cortical thinning. Um, whereas the MCI group showed, or was, MCI was associated with faster antirrhinal and hippocampal atrophy compared to um, normal controls. And subtle cognitive decline operationally defined using sensitive neuropsychological measures can be identified prior to or during the preclinical stages of amyloid deposition. And it might even track early antirrhinal pathologic changes. So the Brock stages of Alzheimer's disease, um, the different diseases stages for neurofibrillar tangle um, progression suggests that you know, antirrhinal cortex is affected before the hippocampus. So we kind of have this um, uh, dissociation here, you know, where the objective subtle cognitive decline group was showing um, faster antirrhinal um, thinning, whereas MCI, who are farther along, you know, have more cognitive impairment, are showing both faster antirrhinal and hippocampal atrophy. So I think that's a nice, um, nice finding there. And so, you know, in sum, it looks like you know, this type of definition of subtle cognitive decline, you know, it's a sensitive, non-invasive predictor of um, future amyloidosis, neurodegeneration, and before, you know, there's frank cognitive impairment that we see um, and associate with mild cognitive impairment. So I already showed this slide earlier, these different but there are alternate models. So the two-hit vascular hypothesis of Alzheimer's disease put forward by Zlokovich, um, people may be familiar with this. It's been around for a few years, um, but it's thought that vascular factors such as hypertension and diabetes um, lead to blood-brain barrier dysfunction and reduce blood flow, which then um, lead later to um, amyloid accumulation um, neurodegeneration, and then ultimately cognitive decline and dementia. So th this provides you know, an opportunity to look at some vascular biomarkers, which is something that I'm really interested in. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, we have amyloid and, and tau and neurodegeneration in this model, which are kind of our, our current Alzheimer's biomarkers. But features associated with the first hit, so the vascular you know, factors um, in this model would lead to earlier therapeutic opportunities than currently avail available. And also, you know, vascular factors such as hypertension and diabetes are potentially, um, potentially modifiable you know, with existing treatments. So I'm gonna talk about you know, a couple different um, studies that we've done looking at um, vascular contributions to um, cognitive impairment. So this was a study that we published a few years ago now, um, but we had 84 Alzheimer's patients who underwent vascular risk assessment and later underwent brain autopsy. Um, we excluded individuals who had pathologic processes other than Alzheimer's disease or cerebrovascular changes um, and, and large stroke. Um, and we looked at several different vascular risk factors, um, including cholesterol, blood pressure, stroke or TIA, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, atrial fibrillation, and smoking. And we created some aggregate um, vascular risk scores as well. And so this table shows, you know, we had an Alzheimer's disease plus cerebrovascular changes group, and then we had an Alzheimer's disease without cerebrovascular change group, so kind of a pure Alzheimer's disease group. And this just shows, you know, the different um, vascular risk factors. And what we found was, um, with the exception of TI and stroke, individual vascular risk factors were not associated with cerebrovascular changes. It really was the presence of multiple vascular risk factors that was associated with cerebrovascular changes. Um, and vascular risk factors were associated with cerebrovascular changes, but not severity of Alzheimer's disease or um, presence of cerebral amyloid angiopathy, where amyloid um, is in the, in the vessels. So here we have um, the Alzheimer's disease plus cerebrovascular group, and then the pure Alzheimer's disease group. And this is just showing um, kind of the severity of neurofibrillar tangles or Brock stage. So the black um, is, represents um, higher Brock stage or more severe um, Alzheimer's disease pathology. And again, all these people had autopsy confirmed um, Alzheimer's disease, but we see that the pure AD group you know, um, was more likely to have a high um, Brock stage, so more severe neurofibrillary tangles. Yet there were really, there were no differences in severity of cognitive impairment. So 
These findings suggest that vascular pathology you know, influences clinical expression of Alzheimer's disease, and even in patients with autopsy-confirmed Alzheimer's disease and relatively mild um, cerebrovascular changes. I realize I don't have too much more time, so I'm gonna to try to go through these slides a, a bit quickly. Um, but um, we've been looking at different neuroimaging uh, markers of cerebrovascular dysfunction. And, and one is white matter hyperintensities, which are visualized as increased signal on T2 weighted flare MRI. So you can see on the left, um, just around the ventricles, you can see those bright spots. And then on the right, there's kind of um, more severe or more distributed bright spots. And um, white matter hyperintensities are thought to be a marker of small vessel cerebrovascular disease. And they do predict conversion to mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease. Um, Adam Brickman at Columbia has studied this a lot, um, as well as others. And we recently published this paper in, in Neurobiology of Aging, where we looked at regional white matter hyperintensity volume in MCI subtypes, and also wanted to see if white matter hyperintensities would predict um, decline in, in daily functioning. So we had 618 ADNI participants, um, 301 with normal cognition, 232 with amnestic MCI, and 85 with non-amnestic MCI. And participants underwent neuropsych testing, MRI, and assessment of everyday functioning. We followed them for four years. What we saw kind of across, you know, all of the different regions that we looked at was kind of the stepwise increase. We're in the gray, we have the cognitively normal group with the lowest white matter hyperintensity volume. Then in the middle in green is the amnestic MCI. And then the non-amnestic MCI in blue had, had um, the highest you know, level of white matter hyperintensities. And we also did find that white matter hyperintensity predicted faster um, functional um, decline. Um, I'm also very interested in looking at our teal spin labeling. MRI. So this is a non-invasive um, technique to measure cerebral blood flow. And ASL has been shown to um, show similar patterns of regional hyperfusion um, as studies using FTG PET or SPECT. But ASL has advantages over PET and SPECT because it's not um, it's not invasive, whereas these other techniques do involve um, a tracer that has to be injected. Um, and it also provides a quantitative measurement of cerebral blood flow. So we've done many different studies in ASL MRI and have shown that it's a useful biomarker of cognitive functioning, dementia risk, and normal aging, as well as across many different risk groups, you know, including MCI, um, APOE4 carriers, those with elevated vascular risk, those with abnormal amyloid. And more recently, we um, looked at cerebral blood flow and subtle cognitive decline. And so here, we, this is in ADNI, um, and this is a recently accepted paper um, so we have different regions here, hippocampus, inferior parietal um, lobe, and inferior temporal gyrus. We have the cognitively unimpaired group in blue, um, the objective subtle cognitive decline in green, and then MCI in purple. We actually saw this really interesting inverted U shape um, across these different groups where we actually saw higher um, cerebral blood flow in the subtle cognitive decline group. Um, and depending on the region, we did see lower um, blood flow and MCI compared to the cognitively unpaired group, um, which we've seen in other studies that we've done. So again, we, there was this inverted U pattern of CBF, so some hyperperfusion and subtle cognitive decline, and that was really interesting um, to us. And other groups have shown this um, as well, that these risk groups might actually have higher blood flow compared to um, you know, people who are at lower risk. And this is something we need to look in uh, look into more and study more, but um, one idea is this is, could be some early neurovascular dysregulation, whereas, whereby higher CBF is needed to maintain cognitive functioning. Um, we've also seen that baseline cerebral blood flow predicts decline in cognition and also in everyday function. So this, um, these graphs here are looking at um, FAQ again, and we have um, people who had the lowest um, blood flow at baseline in blue, um, middle um, in green, and then the highest blood flow in red. And again, higher scores reflect greater functional difficulties. So across um, medial temporal lobe, inferior temporal and parietal lobes, um, we saw this pattern um, where um, reduced baseline blood flow predicted greater decline, faster decline. Um, we didn't see that in the pericalcerin, which was our um, control region where we wouldn't expect differences. 
So just to um, summarize, you know, MCI and Alzheimer's disease, they're heterogeneous and often involve multiple pathologies. Um, there's growing evidence that vascular dysfunction occurs early in Alzheimer's disease. And studying vascular mechanisms will help, um, help elucidate Alzheimer's disease pathogenesis and also might suggest treatment targets given that some vascular risk factors you know, might be modifiable with lifestyle um, changes or medications. So we need to continue you know, to refine techniques to detect pathology in asymptomatic and prodromal individuals and really a multifaceted approach that integrates biomarker, so CSF, MRI, and neuropsychological assessments will likely be needed to characterize you know, the earliest um, phases of dementia. And again, vascular contributions um, play an important role, but have been understudied you know, thus far. And with that, I want to thank you and um, also acknowledge my wonderful collaborators um, at UCSD who spearheaded a lot of this work. So again, Mark Bondi, Emily Edmonds, Kelsey Thomas, Lisa Delena Wood, um, Amy Jack, and of course, our research participants and volunteers and also funding sources because we couldn't do this work um, without them. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bang, and that was such a wonderful and very thorough um, presentation. Um, I am curious if you have a couple of minutes for questions. We did receive a few questions. I know yes. I yes, I do, and I apologize. Um, I was trying to keep track of time, but I apologize for talking so long. No, that's all right. It was very thorough. Um, I know personally most of my questions are answered right as soon as you hit the next slide. Um, but we still did get a couple of overarching um, questions. So the first one um, is many people use MCI as somewhat of a catch-all diagnosis for anything between intact and major uh, neurocognitive impairment. Are there times that you recommend not using the term MCI? It seems like based on your research looking at the underlying pathology of MCI, maybe you think of the term now as more specific to certain diagnostic entities? Yeah, no, that's um, a good point. And so, um, you know, usually, especially in clinic, um, you know, we often do diagnose MCI, but it is also kind of that two-pronged approach um, that kind of was referred to in the National Institute on Aging Alzheimer's Association, um, you know, a criteria where, you know, first diagnosing MCI and then trying to get at the etiology. Um, you know, there are times where, you know, if someone has, um, you know, impairments, that you know might be related to something like mood, it's thought, or something like that. That maybe you know isn't necessarily a neurodegenerative condition, such as Alzheimer's disease. I think there's you know some debate around whether um, or not to you know diagnose MCI in those types of cases. Um, but we do try to. Um, we always have feedback sessions in our clinic and try to provide a lot of you know, education, um, especially about prognosis, because people want to know that and yes many people with MCI do go on to convert um, but not necessarily and it does depend a lot of course um, you know based on the underlying etiology um, and I focus on Alzheimer's disease and vascular disease a lot here because that's you know my main interest areas and also you know with base rates with older adults um, kind of the most common causes of um, dementia but yes there can be many you know different um, underlying etiologies and often there are mixed etiologies. Okay, um, the next question relates to um, the objectively subtle cognitive difficulties research. Um, it says, how do objectively subtle cognitive difficulties take into account ba uh, base rates for chance impaired performance in normal adults? Yeah, no, that's a, um, that's a really, really um, good question. Um, and some of that is, you know, we're, we're trying, um, you know, we're trying to link it to, you know, biomarkers and progression to better understand this. Are these people on the trajectory, um, you know, to develop, to progress and to develop, you know, MCI um, and to develop eventually dementia likely. Um, and so that's why a lot of this ongoing um, research, um, you know, is, is happening to better understand that. Um, but th that, you know, that point is well taken and some people, you know, do really advocate for the importance of, you know, longitudinal testing with some of this to see if people really, you know, are um, declining because yes, people are starting out in different places. Um, absolutely. Alrighty, next question. Um, and that'll be our last question for today. 
Uh, how do you typically respond to patients who ask about recommendations for genetic testing, for example, APOE status? Do you typically support or advise against it at this stage? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question as well. You know, in our um, various research studies, we do do, um, you know, testing for APOE4, um, and we don't disclose it um, in part because, you know, we all know this is not anything deterministic. Although it increases your risk, you can get Alzheimer's disease, you know, without the APOE4. And people, you know, who are carriers, you know, may not develop it. So there have been studies on this that it, it you know, and I think there are, of course, you know, different thoughts about it, but it can create anxiety. And there have even been studies suggesting that it can um, influence performance on cognitive testing if people know they're, they're E4 carriers. Um, but I think it's really, um, you know, each person's decision, you know, whether they, you know, would like to know or not. And now that we do have, you know, 23andMe and some of these, um, you know, like direct to consumer at home testing kits, people can get that information. Um, so I think the important thing is just that people are really, you know, well informed. Um, and that's the thing with a lot of these testing kits, you know, that's, that information is not provided in that education, um, or maybe people can find that. But um, just to, so it's clear to people that, that you know, this is not um, anything deterministic. Um, but yeah, in, in our studies, um, we have not told, we made the decision not to inform people. Um, and in clinic, um, people actually haven't asked about it too much. Um, but I think I, you know, would tell people that, you know, it's their decision, but kind of go through this um, information and education. Um, so to make sure they understand that, you know, um, it's just a susceptibility um, gene is not deterministic. Gotcha. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Mangan, for your talk today. Um, I know it was very informative for me and, and, and I'm sure for others. Um, I would like to let everyone know that we will be uh, providing the information for our next segment later on this week. So keep an eye out for that email probably this Wednesday for next, uh, next month's lecture series. Thank you so much, Dr. Bang, and thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank you for the wonderful questions. Yeah. All right.